An interesting variation of rubber forming on the oil hydraulic press is being tried experimentally in one plant. This method is of particular interest because of the fact that an ordinary hydraulic press is used with no modification whatever. The novelty lies in the fact that instead of a single die only with the rubber acting as the punch, mating metal dies are used with a sheet of rubber simply laid over the punch. The real ingenuity of the method, however, is in the fact that the punch and die do not exactly fit each other, causing the rubber to flow in a controlled manner into the cavity left when the two are brought together. Here is an example of one of the many ways that this might work out. In this case, the punch has a somewhat shallower curvature than the die. When the two come together, the blank is first gripped tightly at the edges, as in a double acting die. It takes on the curvature of the punch, and then as the squeeze continues, the rubber flows in and stretches the sheet to the curvature of the female die. The punch may be cast over the die as usual, then altered in form by machining it down where the rubber is to flow, or it may be built up by brazing to increase the pressure at any desired point. A noteworthy improvisation is this ordinary hydraulic press, which has been transformed into a double acting one. The cylinders are simply placed on the bed of the press when the double action is desired. All the cylinders operate from a common oil line. The pressure ring is supported on the hydraulic cylinders. As the punch moves down, the edge of the blank is firmly gripped by the ring and held throughout the forming of the part. The same idea can be applied to a crank press. Hydro press dies are quickly set up, whereas mating steel dies take considerable time. All the sheet metal forming operations in the manufacture of the average plane take only three and one half percent of the total man hours. Even if you cut that in half, it would make a small difference in the overall result. A difference far smaller than the time lost in setting up steel dies for the small quantities in which airplane parts must be made. More designers than ever before are working on improvements. And when control, stability, performance, or military effectiveness is bettered, our fighting men should not have to wait until next year's model. That fact alone precludes any high production of most plane parts. It is unusual to make more than two or three hundred of a plane without changes. Even if a thousand parts are needed, sheet metal cannot be tied up in dead stock in wartime. If it were, the plant would not have enough sheet stock for other parts and would not be able to assemble any planes at all. The plants are making planes, not parts. Loading and unloading the bolster plate takes considerably longer than the forming action, so that on a press with a single plate, a great part of the working time is wasted. This has led to many schemes for equipping a press with several bolster plates, one of the most convenient of which is this circular table arrangement. The same principle has also been applied to much larger machines. One of the most impressive is this six table arrangement designed for the maximum possible output. One plate slides in and out followed by the one opposite. Then the rubber pad rotates so as to be parallel to another pair of plates. These slide in and out, the pad rotates again, and the cycle is repeated, with the press working continuously. For parts needed in fair quantity, and where smoothness and accuracy of shape are essential, the hydro press is unequaled. For one thing, there is no thinning of the part. Engine cowl sections, fuel and oil tanks, enclosure covers, pontoon skins, and countless other parts may be made on the hydro press.
a curved flange is formed, there is a surplus of metal. Since the rubber pad has no tendency to iron out these wrinkles, some provision must be made for the flow of the metal. Notches may be cut, or, as in this case, the die may be provided with wrinkles at a point where they will do no harm, avoiding their formation at undesirable places. It is unusual for a hydro-press die to be fastened in position. In this case, however, the die slopes to one side and would tend to slip when pressure is applied. So lead is poured at the ends to secure it in place. A simple machine has been improvised to give the metal a slight initial forming before it goes into the hydro press. Thousands of parts may be turned out in a day, yet the setup of a die is so simple that a run of as little as 20 parts may be economically produced. Here is a real veteran, still in service, a press so old that it uses water instead of oil. On this particular machine, the first flying fortress was made and it is still in use, turning out parts. An improvised rubber pad has been fitted to it, but the setup is insufficient to form a deep draw. So, such parts are formed as deeply as possible, then water is poured into the depression. This liquid being non-compressible, the pressure is transmitted to the sheet and the forming completed. No machine, however old and primitive, stands idle in the aircraft industry. New machines might be welcome, but in the meantime, airplanes are being made on every piece of equipment available. For perhaps the first time, a major industry has been built up with relatively untrained labor and with standard machine tools such as might be found in almost any factory across the country. Drop hammers, punch presses, spinning lathes, hydraulic presses, not the sort of thing to impress a high production executive, perhaps, but these methods of horse and buggy days are doing a grand job of turning out the planes so urgently needed. Crude, old-fashioned methods, some of them, but they do answer civilization's demand for planes, planes, and more planes. Never again must our forces be called upon to reenact these tragic scenes at Wake Island, where our boys so desperately needed planes to fight the Japs. Japs that swarmed in from all directions. everything at hand. They patched their four remaining planes with parts from planes destroyed on the ground. They were no match for the overwhelming squadrons of the Nipponese. But in spite of it, they fought on. Machine guns had to be converted to anti-aircraft guns. Our boys had to do the best they could with what they had. They died so the folks back home might live. They fought until their last plane was sent plummeting to the ground. of planes. We must not delay. We must supply our forces with planes, planes, and more planes. They did the best they could with what they had. And we too must do the best we can with what we've got.